The goal of Data Transformers podcast is to accelerate digital transformation by bridging the gap between business outcomes and rapidly advancing technologies. And we aim to bridge this gap by focusing on data. I am Peggy Sai, top 50 women in tech influencer, co-author of the AI book, and data governance expert. I'm Ramesh Danta, an entrepreneur, a tech blogger, and AI enthusiast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Data Transformers podcast. Here is part two of our discussion with Jill Deshay, strategy consultant and executive advisor. So, Jill, um, one of the, uh, the next segment, we are going to focus a little bit more on your journey. And uh, for me, the most fascinating thing is, is your journey, right? It's uh, what I consider is a little bit unconventional, right? It has not uh, been... Um, typically you, you join some organization growing that, but you, you moved across and you founded companies, you sold companies. And uh, so if you could uh, you know, just walk us briefly about your journey, then we want to go a little bit deep into you know, what, what those a- areas were. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because I, you know, I started with a liberal arts education in undergrad, right? And so it, it's interesting to have, uh, you know, had a technology career. And, and I remember just being really sorry for those choices, right? And ultimately, I'm actually really happy that I had a liberal arts yeah. degree because I think, you know, in a lot of cases, us, you know, English majors are a minority in technology and we bring a certain skill set that isn't necessarily per- Pervasive. And so, you know, I started as a technical writer at Honeywell Information Systems writing about this brand new technology called relational databases. And um, as you guys know, um, if you write about something, you learn about it, right? Yeah. And so at the end of that kind of, you know, internship, I remember thinking, you know, people would come to me asking me these technical questions about, you know, if you, you know, if you put this in a where clause, then, you know, is it and or is it or, you know, and I, I remember <laughs> thinking, you know, my mother would never believe this, you know, so, um, so, you know, ultimately, I think that's really served me well, and it's helped me write the books and, 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 you know, express some ideas. And so I, you know, that, that I think has been a interesting path for, you know, the choices I've made in terms of, you know, the companies that I've, I've started, I'm on the board of a couple startups right now. And um, just, you know, it's just really interesting, because it's, it's atypical, but at the same time, I think it's actually really important. So, and I know there's controversy, there's been controversy over in, in the tech community at large, I think, um, who was it, Vinod Kosla, um, wrote an article in the, I, I don't know, in some big newspaper about how, you know, liberal arts education isn't important. Everybody needs to learn to code. And, you know, I thought that, you know, that was a little bit, um, it, I, I think we have to give more importance to diversity these days. And, and not only just, you know, um, diversity of people, but neurodiversity, neurodiversity right? yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in that. And, and there's been studies that shown that even, you know, diverse boards of directors, their, pro- their companies are more profitable than, you know, boards of directors that aren't as diverse, right? So, okay. um, you know, I, I, I think that's been kind of a, a thread that's been interwoven throughout the various career choices that I've made is, is, you know, Am I going to learn something? Um, and are are people, you know, am I and am I going to be with a team that wants to learn together? Yeah. And actually, I think there was a a study recently that Google shared that um, one of the um, attributes they're looking for is actually people who don't know how to code. It's more like the liberal arts, the humanities um, that they're f- focused on, and. I, I went to a high school that was all humanities based where I learned Latin and Spanish and English for all four years. So I feel that um, that has certainly helped with the communication. Yeah. And I feel like that is the biggest part that's missing in data because it's not just a technical piece. I think anybody, most people can, can learn how to code and to, to run uh, and write in R, but it's actually communicating and explaining the uh, the results um, and then tying it to the business value and the so what's right the questions that we're trying to ask um, absolutely amen to that too because I mean I remember you know in a story storytelling was you know like three years ago was the hot topic right yeah. in data science and and even apart from data science and I remember thinking 
finally, you know, I mean, we've been kind of implicitly telling stories, you know, about technology and about technologies, you know, use for years and years. And finally, it's actually above ground, we can actually own storytelling, you know, and it's, it's fascinating, because, um, you know, for a while there, people were saying, you know, data scientists have to be storytellers. And I don't think that that worked out so well. I think data science is actually more of a, a team effort, you know, and there will be people who can take that data science and tell stories about it. But I'm not sure that, you know, um, you can be successful doing all that. I do think it's actually a collaboration. Yeah, that's true. So Jill, I mean, I think many of us, uh, the people I, I talk to, my colleagues or people, uh, even though they have a career, they always secretly aspire, uh, uh, you know, to be an entrepreneur, to start something, right? And your baseline consulting, how you started has an interesting story. So how did you go from a career executive to thinking of starting a company or starting a company? If, if, just uh, if you could guide people, what goes into that? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, there were a few of us, um, you know, who kind of came out of Teradata Corporation, which was a pioneer in, um, you know, large scale relational database uh, work as a vendor. And, um, you know, Teradata was talking about the value of data long before data became hot. And so, you know, we were sitting around going, God, look at, I mean, you know, this was back in the 1990s, you know, I mean, look at what we could do with data, look at, you know, um, and, and how come all these companies aren't doing this with data? And we started to get some work and then, then pretty much hung the baseline shingle, right? Um, so, you know, it's like, wow, this could be a business. Um, so um, I'd love to say that, you know, we had a proactive business plan before we quit our jobs and we knew exactly exactly who we were going to be, but it really did evolve to us being kind of a boutique specialty firm in data and analytics before that stuff got hot. Um, and, you know, we, we got clients very quickly. And I mean, it was typically the big guys. It was the Bell Souths and the Citibanks of the world who, you know, who were in general were making those investments before, you know, other companies and even in some cases, other competitors. Um, so I'd love to say that there was a you know, a, a high level, you know, kind of dastardly plan in the works, but really we just, um, we just kind of um, led with our skill set and allowed our clients to, you know, um, you know, hire us and, and, and then refer us. So it was very organic in a lot of ways. Oh, sorry. But obviously there were, um, you know, working for a stable company versus creating something on your own, is, is a big risk, right? And not many people are um, willing to take that risk. And so, you know, just love to have you dig deeper into really explain how, why and how you just took that leap of faith. I mean, because that's very interesting and, and, and unique about you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it was it, it was interesting. I was living in Paris um, and and doing some consulting work in Paris, independent consulting work. Um, and um, I remember moving back to the states, thinking, okay, I, I had two choices. One, um, if I if I bought cigarettes in the United States, I would be a smoker, so I had to not buy cigarettes. And then if I if took a job, a full-time job in the United States, um, I would be an employee again. So I had to make those two choices. You want to be a smoker and you want to be an employee. Didn't want to be a smoker, stop smoking, you know, because, you know, in Paris, you know, it's hard. It's hard. Um, and, and, and even now when I, you know, go back to Paris, you know, I'm guilty. But, um, it, you know, the other thing was, was you know, that independent stuff in, in France was, was quite eye-opening. And, you know, you can kind of guide your own future. And we, we kind of, even as Baseline grew, um, I think our, our, our consultants, our staff, um, you know, we all collaborated together on what clients we wanted to take. And one of the proudest moments of, of my career was actually turning down a particular retailer mm -hmm. um, who wanted to engage us because we didn't love their business practices. And I remember them saying, you know, no, you need to be here at our headquarters to pitch your engagement. And I just said, you know, no, no, we're not gonna do it. And then they finally called back and they, they thought it was because of the date that they wanted us to come. So they called us back and they said, okay, we've changed, we've agreed to change the date so you can be here. Still no, you know? And I, re I remember having that, you know, that luxury um, was, was a really cool thing, 
you know, and I, I think a lot of our consultants also, you know, in as much as, you know, we, 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 we got clients and we, you know, we, we did what they told us to do. We recommended, you know, new approaches. Um, you know, our rule was um, when you disagree with the client's choice, you put it in right, you know, you tell them twice and you put it in writing once and then you do what the client wants, wants you to do. But I think there was a certain level of flexibility and frankly, a certain level of adventure that none of us would have had had we, you know, gone to work for a big bank. Nothing against that because we were working in big banks. Um, but again, it's back to that diversity of experience. You know, we were working with big retailers. We were working with big hospitals. We were working with big tech companies, right? And I think that gave us all a breadth that has served us all well um, since baseline. So, Jill, another thing is that you're very passionate about some things like the rescue dog shelters, and, and obviously you founded this uh, right now. Uh, but uh, you are also able to combine your interest in analytics with the rescue dog shelters. I think in uh, uh, last time we spoke, uh, you told us a story about how you used analytics to figure out, dig more into this. So can you talk a little bit about that, how people can combine both aspects so make it much more meaningful for their lives. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been really interesting because uh, we go around to these various animal shelters across Southern California, and we we keep we we meet um, dogs who are typically um, urgent for, um, for behavior reasons or because of how they look or maybe they've got a medical issue, and we videotape those dogs and we we get some data about those dogs and we track that data. Um, we actually put that data, you know, in and we and we track that data. And over time, we see trends, right? And we're learning things that the general animal rescue community didn't know before, right? So, um, you know, uh, for example, um, owners that surrender animals, uh, you know, we, we know that the number one reason, an, you know, owners surrender animals is because they're moving. Right. But what we also are learning is that there are resources for those owners that those owners don't know about. Um, there are these intervention organizations that will help owners find new housing or, um, you know, legal organizations that will um, challenge pit bull bans, for instance. Right. And so, um, you know, it's it's fascinating to see the data uh, evolve in terms of the reasons animals come in, reasons animals leave. Um, for a while, there was something called black dog syndrome, where black dogs would not get rescued or, or saved uh, as often as dogs of other colors. Uh, the awareness of that in the last several years has caused that those save levels to actually go up and people are actually adopting black dogs more because they go in wanting to help a black dog, knowing that black dogs are more at risk for euthanasia. So we see not only the data tell us the trends, but as people learn about those trends, those trends start to change. So, you know, and that's what we want. You know, we're all kind of in the uh, in the camp of, of something called no kill. 2025, where by the year 2025, um, euthanasia will only be done on animals that are uh, suffering and all other animals will actually get a shot. You know, people won't be killing uh, animals for space. And so we keep a lot of that data so that we can monitor today's trends and actually apply them to tomorrow's outcomes. Wow, that, that's really fascinating, Jill, and um, your ability to combine two passions together. Um, on this project. Um, yeah, because nobody was doing it. And, and it's yeah. cute now because now the animal rescue world wants to be data driven and people are starting to talk about data and people are starting to talk about dashboards, life-saving dashboards, right? Um, and so it's been kind of cool to be in the middle of that and, and watch this kind of right-hand turn and this awareness bloom about what data can tell us um, to save more animals. I'm just curious also, is the data that you collect, um, uh, is it open to, to other organizations to, to look at as well? Um, I'm, just, I'm curious uh, how, how the openness of the data is. Yeah, we're, we're actually sharing the results of our analytics as opposed to the raw data. Um, right now, only because there, you know, there's some, there's some identifiable information that there's a, um, an understandable, just like in business, there's an understandable um, sensitivity to PII type data. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so people don't want to necessarily, shelters don't necessarily want to identify or disclose 
surrendering owners or, you know, households that have returned animals back to the shelter, you know, so, um, so we're, sh we're sharing the results of the analytics as opposed to the raw data at this point, but that might change. Hmm. So Jill, uh, it's, it's a different part of the discussion. We all want to think I was born a superstar. Nobody helped me. I became whatever I is kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I don't think you think like that, but uh, you're a superstar. So we all know we are not born superstars. So people helped us along the way, influencers, mentors, you know, it could be people, it could be, you know, some books or some life-changing events that also help us. So in your case, what has been the situation? You know, I, I tend to learn from the failures of others and the failures of, of, you know, me, yours truly looking in the mirror, but I, um, you know, one of the one of the things we did when we started Baseline is we looked at other small consulting firms and we saw how they were treating their people. And, you know, um, so it was more like a we're never going to do that. We're never going to do that. Right. And, and so, you know, it's it's interesting just learning from failures, which in a way means that that company or that person who was, you know, not, you know, not getting it right was was, you know, helpful in their own way, you know, but um yeah. So, you know, I just, I, I look at companies and what they did wrong and, and we've incorporated a lot of that into, you know, um, and, you know, at baseline, we incorporated a lot of those lessons learned into the firm. You know, one of the examples um, was we decided that our company was, um, let me get this right. While we, while revenues were, were a, a corporate um, objective, they weren't a corporate purpose. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we would do um, around this time every year is we would let employees vote on a particular charity. And then we would kind of score those votes and we would have a corporate charity for the year and they would get a percentage of our, our profits for that year. And um, we would collaborate with them on marketing and, you know, um, publicity and things like that all year long we'd put their logo on our website this is our charity of the year kind of thing and not only did that you know help the the organization in question but I think it also gave our employees a sense of of purpose and belonging and you know it was its own kind of fun collaborative effort and it was a fun part of the job for the partners too because we got to choose the short list and then the employees got to choose the the finalists and we had some great organizations and learned a lot so um, about the books itself, Jill, uh, I know you have multiple books. And then uh, I recently read that you have a book in your head, but there's so much there. The book is not coming out. So what has been um, the theme of your books? Are, are there different areas or are you going deeper into one area? So can, can you talk a little bit about what you're writing about? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because... Um, the, the thread interwoven throughout the four books that I've written has been the business value of data and technology, right? So, you know, my first book was called E-Data, you know, it focused more on, you know, it was in the days of e-commerce and how, you know, my, my hypothesis was the earlier that companies that are adopting e-commerce start collecting data, the more competitive they will be, right? Mm -hmm. And so then, um, then I wrote the CRM handbook, which kind of, you know, furthered that the more, you know, we understand the data about customers, the better off we'll be. Um, and then, you know, uh, me and my partner, Evan Levy, wrote um, a customer data integration book that was a little bit more technical when it came to, you know, customer data and what you could do with it. Uh, and then finally, the new IT, which kind of takes the principles of technology and data and, you know, kind of tells, you know, a different story about how IT can use those to transform itself. So I'm, I'm rewriting an ebook right now in the animal welfare space that touches on a lot of that stuff, uh, particularly the promise of technology to further animal welfare and not mm. just technology, but business processes as well. Animal welfare is very 1996 when it comes to technology and, and, you know, formalized business processes. And so uh, right now I'm, I'm kind of applying some of those past principles to the animal welfare space. And that's going to be, um, it was originally an ebook. I'm now adopting it for COVID because COVID has had a huge effect, both bad right. and good, 
on um, on animal welfare, and it's going to be a web a web handbook. And just curious if you have ideas for other books as well in the data or technology space. What do you think you would write about? That's a you know, that's a trend, or do you think that will be on on topic? You know, two to three years from now. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think something that's evergreen as a discussion point that is in motion a little bit, Peggy, is, um, you know, going back to organizational design, uh, organizational structures, and, you know, letting missions and cultures define some of those things, because uh, there's a lot of boilerplate out there about, you know, what IT organizations should look like, what MarTech organizations should look like. And it's not so much to prescribe organizational structures as to, you know, take a look at the factors that should inform them kind of thing. And so it's a bigger discussion than data and analytics in a lot of ways, but at the same time, data and analytics are great. Um, you know, they're kind of a great platform for that discussion. So um, I've been thinking a lot about that because, my, you know, every company I talk to is thinking about it. So I think that's going to be continue to be hot and, you know, continue to kind of evolve in the next couple of years. So that, you know, that's kind of where my head is. And when I write about where my head is, it's probably, it's, it's usually, you know, probably a, a good indicator. Yeah, that's, that's good. So as we wind down this uh, podcast, Jill, one of the things that you introduced, actually, I learned from you is the neurodiversity. It, it's probably it's out there. Maybe I did not run into it, but I've uh, you, uh, learned it from you, right? And, and that's different from gender diversity or you know so other diversities. But um, so if you could elaborate a little bit more on the neurodiversity and then what it means, uh, why is it critical? Yeah, well, neurodiversity just means that people, um, different people, think differently, right? In a simplistic level. But you know what I've also you know seen and, and realized as part of neurodiversity is, is gender diversity, racial diversity. Um, you know, sexual orientation, diversity, all lead toward neurodiversity, you know, life experiences, you know, are, you know, are, are so different. And bringing people together with different life experiences, I think, in increases the richness, not only of discussion, but the richness of ideas and show me, you know, kind of, you know, a, a rich set of heterogeneous ideas. And I'll show you a company that's going to be a lot more creative. Um, a lot less risk averse in a lot of cases uh, and a lot more compelling in terms of its story. That There's actually a could be a great book as well in terms of collecting yeah. all the data and analytics and understanding um, the factors, how, how neurodiverse an organization is and how successful and the um, investments in that area in, in terms of ROI for the company. So. Yeah, no. And in fact, um, the good news, Peggy, is that there are more case positive case studies about that stuff than ever before, too. So we actually have examples. Um, so, you know, that's good news as well. So you're right. You know, that could be a good one, too. I'll put it on the list. <laughs> that's good. Of, I'll be of, your co-author for that. Many things on your list. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. So, um, Jill, thank you very much. Uh, you know, for for this candid and uh, really you know very fascinating discussion thank you guys and congratulations again on the book ramesh oh thank you thank you <laughs> thank you Bill. thank you for listening to today's episode if you liked what you heard today and would like to hear more please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite player like itunes and spotify and please do rate our podcast also please go to our website www.datatransformerspodcast.com for more episodes, blogs, and information on our speakers. Thank you.